So here we are in the final module for this course, where we're going to talk about high availability and site resilience. First, I'll give you a quick recap of what we've learned about high availability and site resilience for the mailbox and client access courses in this series. Since we need to consider the same type of failure scenarios for transport as we do for the other services, it'll be useful to do a quick refresher on those. Then we'll talk about using multiple MX records for inbound mail flow, multiple outbound routes for email that is going to external recipients, and finally, queue resubmission and rerouting. Let's just spend a few minutes going back over the high availability and site resilience for mailbox and client access services. If you haven't watched those courses in this series yet, don't worry, you'll learn about them in much more depth when you get to those courses, but for now, this is just a quick overview. For Mailbox services, we looked at deploying a Database Availability Group, or DAG. With the right design, the DAG was able to keep databases online by failing over database copies to another replica if there was a failure of a single server. And we also looked at how a whole data center could fail and a data center switchover could be performed to bring the DAG online in the secondary location. For client access, we looked at deploying an unbound namespace that could resolve to the Exchange servers using DNS round robin or load balancing, and how Exchange front-end services would proxy connections to whichever server hosted the mailbox at the time. Making them all work together in a cooperative and resilient manner, even if one or more of the servers were actually down. So we need to think along similar lines for transport as well. Mailbox and client access are resilient to multiple different failure scenarios. So transport also needs to be resilient to multiple different failure scenarios. We need to consider inbound mail flow from external senders, outbound mail flow to external recipients, and internal mail flow as well. And we need to be aware of what will happen under different failure scenarios, how our design addresses those issues, and how we as administrators need to respond for specific circumstances. Using multiple MX records is actually quite a simple way to achieve high availability for your inbound email routes. All you really need to do is add more than one MX record in DNS and point that to another public IP address that NATs to another Exchange server. But then you also need to think about how you want those MX records to be used. Each MX record has a priority, and there's a few ways you can use that priority or preference value to influence how the MX records are used by other email servers that are sending you email. You can either use all MX records equally by configuring them all to the same priority or preference. And by equally, I don't mean that the inbound email traffic will be perfectly load balanced between them all, There'll be some randomness to how other servers pick which MX to use when there are multiple MXs with the same priority, but this is the simplest configuration and because all available inbound routes get used on an ongoing basis, you can generally be confident that if a problem creeps in with one of them, that you'll notice it pretty quickly through traffic patterns or email delays instead of one day cutting over to a secondary MX and suddenly discovering it's not working. The other approach is to set different priorities on the MX records so that one or a few of them are the most preferred. This is still quite simple to configure, it's just different priority values on the DNS records. Generally you'll see other mail servers respecting your MX preferences and using your most preferred MX most of the time. And having different priorities like this is useful if your secondary MX goes to a disaster recovery site with less bandwidth than your production site, or if you want to route mail into the geographic location where the majority of users are located. Here's an example of using multiple MX records with the same priority. In the public DNS zone, we can create four MX records, each with the same priority of 10, and each pointing to a different A record. We then use those A records, MX1, MX2, MX3, and MX4, to resolve to public IP addresses on the firewalls in San Francisco and New York, 
which NAT to each of the exchange servers internal to the organization. When mail comes in and reaches any of those internet facing servers, internal email routing takes care of it from there. And the mail will be delivered to the mailbox that it was addressed to. Another way to approach this is to use one MX per data center and load balance the traffic instead. This will have basically the same outcome, but it introduces a little more complexity with the fact that you have to install and manage those load balances. Here's an example of using multiple MX records with different priority values. So you can see that MX1, 2, 3, and 4 still exist in this case, but their priorities are set to different values of 10, 20, 30, and 40. Sending servers will then tend to use the MX that is most preferred, which is the MX that has the lowest priority value, which in this example is 10. The lowest value is the most preferred, which sounds backwards, but that's how it works. It might make more sense to you if you think of it as a cost instead, which some mail systems do refer to it as anyway, but in DNS terms, it's often referred to as a priority or preference. In all of these solutions, the outcome is that multiple inbound routes exist thanks to multiple MX records. Sending servers will try the most preferred MX, and if it can't be reached, will try the next most preferred MX, and so on. So under various server or data center failure scenarios, as long as at least one MX is still available, you'll still have inbound mail flow working. One final point about these MX records, the same concept applies whether you're natting those inbound SMTP connections to mailbox servers or to edge transport servers. Whether you run edge transport or not has no real impact on your MX record strategy. Having dealt with high availability and site resilience for the inbound mail flow, let's look at outbound mail flow. From previous videos, we know that outbound mail flow is controlled using send connectors. Each send connector has one or more source servers that are used to route mail out that send connector. The source servers can either be mailbox servers or they can be edge transport servers that have been subscribed to that Active Directory site. You might think that the solution to establishing multiple outbound routes is to create one send connector per server in each site. This is an unnecessarily complex approach. Instead, one send connector per internet facing site is an appropriate solution with each connector having multiple source servers configured. Send connectors have a cost just like AD site links and that cost is taken into account for calculating the least cost route out of the organization. Unequal costs on send connectors is a way of controlling which send connector is used for outbound mail. For example, in this situation, New York servers will see the lower cost route via San Francisco rather than their own send connector. Routing all of your email out one data center might seem logical for some situations, but it means that your backup route is not getting used very much, if at all. And so the public IP address that the backup route uses is not earning reputation as a good sender. This could impact delivery of your email if all your mail suddenly starts going out the backup route because you've had a problem with your primary route. Other mail systems see a new IP address for your domain's email and treat it with suspicion, at least for a little while. So it's generally recommended to make use of all of your outbound routes all of the time to keep the IP addresses warm, so to speak. Now, if you're using edge transport servers, the same concepts apply. But instead of manually configuring send connectors, you simply subscribe one or more edge transport servers to each site. The connectors are all configured for you as part of the edge subscription process and outbound mail flow will be made highly available. So again, by establishing outbound email routes that utilize all of the internet facing data centers and servers, we achieve high availability and site resilience for outbound email as well. Finally, let's look at queue resubmission and rerouting. Now, hopefully at this stage of the course, you've realized that Exchange is pretty smart when it comes to routing email. Exchange knows when routes are unavailable because connectivity to servers over those routes fails and is clever enough to try other routes or queue and retry messages. 
Therefore, the best way to make Mailflow resilient to failure is to deploy multiple servers into multiple sites and establish multiple inbound and outbound routes using MX records and send connectors. But what about when you need to deal with mail that is stuck in a queue? If mail can't find a route to its destination, it will queue. Transport queues will retry every 10 minutes, or you can force a retry by running the retry queue commandlet, which is useful if you want to speed up testing after you think you've fixed whatever problem is causing the mail to queue in the first place. But if you resolve a routing issue by establishing a new route, such as by changing a connector's cost or establishing a new connector, that will only help new mail items. The mail that's already been categorized and queued won't be re-evaluated for the new route until you run retry queue with the resubmit switch. Another scenario in which queued emails need to be handled is server maintenance. If you're planning to take down an exchange server for maintenance, that server might have mail in its queues that is still retrying delivery. So first you need to drain the transport queues, which basically means telling Exchange to keep processing existing email, but stop accepting new mail into that queue. To drain a transport queue, we just use the set server component state commandlet, set the component hub transport into a state of draining and use the requester maintenance. Now that won't always clear the queues completely because there might be mail still queued to a destination that is currently unavailable. So you also need to redirect those queued messages to another server that can continue trying to deliver them. To do that, we use the redirect message commandlet and specify the server that we're redirecting messages from and then a target server to redirect the messages to. Just keep in mind that neither of those steps will touch the shadow redundancy or safety net mail on the server. That will still be at risk. So hopefully your server design is such that another server elsewhere has another copy of those shadow redundancy or safety net stored messages, just in case your server maintenance doesn't go well. And that brings us to the end of this final module. In this module, we looked at how transport high availability and site resilience relates to mailbox and client access services, how multiple MX records provide resilience for inbound email, how multiple send connectors provide resilience for outbound email, and some considerations for managing messages in transport queues. So through all of that, what has Dave achieved for Globomantics? We saw that Dave was able to add a new SMTP domain to the Globomantics organization for Wired Brain Coffee. He was also able to deploy edge transport servers to handle outbound email and implemented spam protection using the Exchange anti-spam capabilities. We also saw how Dave was able to configure a transport rule to add an email disclaimer to all outbound email and also establish a shared SMTP namespace with Wired Brain Coffee. So where to from here? Look for additional plural site courses in the exam 70-345 series. And if you're interested in additional reading for your exam preparation, the exam reference 70-345, Designing and Deploying Microsoft Exchange Server 2016 is available from Microsoft Press. Thanks for watching, I'll see you in the next course.